Good morning. Very nice to be here. It's my first time in Spain, so um, I've only got in yesterday, but I love what I've seen so far. Uh, later today, you will hear from people who are actually doing projects uh, in technology um, and integrating them into the work that they do with orchestras. And so my task this morning, I think, is to set a frame, to set a way of thinking about it uh, that maybe sets uh, the stage for how you use technology um, in, in what we do. Um, I've worked with many orchestras and arts organizations in the United States, and the thing I find is most interesting is that it's not about just coming up with a great strategy. Uh, strategies are common, you know. Um, the culture of orchestras has to change, the internal culture of it. The way that we do things has to change before you can actually understand and internalize even the best, cult uh, the best strategy possible. So uh, with that in mind, um, there are three kinds of things that we think about when we think about technology. I think the promise of technology in the arts. Um, and one of them is um, to connect. This is the ability to be able to reach vast new ex uh, audiences, to expand the audience, to develop it in a different way, and to connect with people that we otherwise probably wouldn't have a chance to do it. Second way is to enhance the experience that people have while they have uh, contact with us. Um, it expands that, uh, that experience in some kind of way. It enhances it. How can we use technology to do that? Um, and it changes the way that people experience what we do. And finally, uh, the promise of technology is measurement of what it is that we do. Right? We have the ability to test things, the ability to interact with the people that we do it for in a different way, and finally, to be able to understand. Now, the, very, the first two of these, uh, connecting and enhancing, uh, are the things that we mostly talk about when we talk about technology in the arts, right? We want more audience, and we want to be able to think about how we present in a way that might be more relevant to more people. But I actually believe that the, the, the most powerful part of technology is really in this third section, measurement. And if you look at where corporations, uh, major brands, uh, businesses, are investing the most these days. It's in those measurements, uh, the way of being able to understand an audience and be able to track what they're doing and be able to interact with them in a different way. So uh, I'll be talking about all three of these. So the promise of the internet, of course, was that it was going to be able to give us access to everybody and everything and, um, and that that would uh, when people realized how marvelous we were, uh, we would have vastly greater audiences. Uh, we all have visions of people like Lady Gaga who have 43 million, 43 million Twitter followers and a billion views on one video alone. Right? This is, we used to talk about mass media in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, mass media, uh, television. Uh, mass media back then was a few million people, connecting with a few million people. The new mass media, and, and this is ironic because the first wave of the internet was about disintegrating things, about niche audiences and breaking things into pieces, right? But what has happened in just the last few years is that it has been able to re-aggregate uh, the reach of people. And so now it's very typical for the most mass audience to be in the billions rather than in just the millions. So we all have dreams of the, the Lady Gaga kind of reach. And occasionally we get that. This is a uh, YouTube screenshot from a thing that the Seattle Symphony did uh, about six months ago, uh, where they did a concert with a, a pop artist, a rapper, uh, and the woman uh, 
next to the woman in the green dress got up and started doing a very big dance, and all of a sudden the thing was on YouTube, and it got, you see at the bottom there, three million views. Right? This is the kind of thing that tends to get a lot of attention. Whether it actually translates into something else, that might be another question. So that viral reach is something that we're really interested in. We also have a whole new generation of artists who are finding non-traditional ways of being able to make careers. This is Valentina Lisitska, um, a Ukrainian uh, pianist who has 100,000 YouTube subscribers and 60 million views. Uh, to go to one of her concerts is a very different thing. It's interactive. She'll come out on stage and take a picture of the audience and it gets up on social media. There's a very different kind of relationship that such artists are having uh, with uh, the people who follow them. Uh, then we also have things like the Metropolitan Opera, uh, which has uh, uh, projected um, their uh, productions into movie screens, more than 2,000 theaters around the world. Uh, but they think about it in a different way. It's not simply taking what's on stage and trying to do a facsimile of it in the theater. It's actually creating a new art form. They think about it cinematically. They think about it in a different language. I actually believe that it's a, it's a, it's a different art form than opera itself, and it gets its own fans. So there's typically a million to two million people who are seeing a performance, way more than the Metropolitan Opera would ever get uh, on its stage. Uh, and quite profitable, too. So we have this idea that if only we can reach this vast audience, that things will be a lot better. Um, the thing is, is that those people are connecting with one another uh, on such a massive level that doesn't require any kind of official sort of uh, hubs and spokes to go through, uh, that reaching them is elusive, particularly if these are platforms controlled by organizations like Facebook and Twitter, because the rules constantly change, which I will talk about in just a moment. And in addition, the messages, the content, the, the activity that is out there is so vast that there are so many things fighting for our attention that it is very difficult to um, is very difficult to stand out. It requires a much more sophisticated idea about who it is you're trying to reach and how you're going to reach them. We think about viral marketing. Uh, if only our video goes viral, uh, then we will get an, arc, uh, a, a, um, an audience for it. Um, but actually, the idea of marketing is changing very significantly. And there's nothing viral about marketing. Vi virality of social media happens on a completely different level. So before we start to figure out how to operate in these new worlds, we need to understand uh, the audience that we're talking to. So in the average day, people get about 13, or they're bombarded with about 13 hours worth of information, right? So uh, about five hours of television a day, two and a half hours of radio, et cetera, et cetera. So there's just a constant bombardment of information which people are processing. By the time the average 18-year-old, uh, by the time a person becomes 18 uh, in the United States, they have watched over 50,000 hours of television. 50,000 hours of television. That's an awful lot of time in front of the screen. Now, we think that it's difficult with symphony orchestras. Try being um, theater, right? Where uh, things on television and things in the cinema used to have some sort of relationship to stage. The way of being able to tell a story on the stage had some, that language, that vocabulary, that way of telling a story had some sort of relationship back to the stage. But now it doesn't anymore. Um, we spend far more time in front of screens. Our relationship with screens is the dominant way that we access artists today. And unless we understand what that language of the screen is, 
you're talking a language to which they're less familiar, in which they're less familiar. Uh, also, the, the kind of interaction that people want to have is changing. Uh, this happens to be in uh, the Louvre. And this is not just a, a special occasion. This is what it looks like on an average day. And what are they looking at? They're looking at this, right? Um, people are not coming necessarily to study or appreciate the art. They're coming to record their experience of having been somewhere, right? It's a very different thing. So creativity for most people now uh, happens to be in what they choose to share. If I choose to share something that's culturally important to me, I'm defining myself. I'm telling you, hey, I think this is cool. I associate myself with this, right? So I build my identity around those things, those pictures, those tweets, those blog posts, those whatever I'm doing. That's how I define myself. And if you are going to be part of their identity, you have to be able to reach them in a way that compels them to want to share it. So these are people for whom a cultural experience is not really complete until they have a chance to share it. Should they choose not to share it, it might mean that in fact it wasn't relevant for them. It's not something that they really paid attention to. So there has to be that level of engagement where people are uh, wanting to share it because that's what they do when something is important to them. And I always say that art really doesn't get its power until people decide to do something with it, right? If you do something, uh, if you give a performance and nobody pays attention to it, then the, the thing that you did doesn't really have a whole lot of power to affect people. So what do we mean? So uh, Shakespeare, for instance, why is Shakespeare considered such a great uh, artist, it's because people have chosen to interpret Shakespeare and reinterpret Shakespeare and make him um, their own, uh, make it relevant to their lives, right? And the greatest art is really something in which people are able to take it and to do something with it. It, 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 it does something for them. And in the process, uh, it changes them, but it also changes the art itself. So I think one of the things that has happened with digital technologies and, and the ways in which we want to share is that our ability to change the art and to be changed by it is changing in some pretty significant ways. These are people who actually have something really important that they want to say. And the question is, is whether we're ready to listen to it or not. So let's think about this in a, in a sort of more global sense. We think about making a great video or great content, great performance or whatever, but the fact is that 70% of everything that is created on the internet this year will not be made by professionals. It's made by people. People sharing things, people changing things, people doing things. And that actually is where the audience is. It's no... Uh, it's no accident that social networks, the Facebooks, Twitters, Pinterest, uh, are the ones with the largest audience because that's where the content that people are making uh, is where people want to go. Right? So you can make the best, most polished thing, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to engage with people. That changes how we have to think about our audience. So we think about, in the old model, an audience. We get up on stage, we do something, the audience receives it, they go away and do something. What we really want to do now, because the problem with, with just having an audience is an audience, uh, every time they decide to go to something, they have to make that decision, that constant decision, right? You become a product. If you think about art as a product and you're selling that product to something, then you're in competition with all of the other millions of products that are vying for our attention. 
So to go for an audience is actually a very difficult thing to do. Far better to try and create fans. What's the difference between fans and an audience? So an audience shows up when they're told to, they buy a ticket, and then they go home. A fan base chooses what they'll pay attention to, right? They have control. Um, an audience goes home after the show, but a fan base sticks around, shares, comments, curates, and creates. In other words, you've inspired them to want to do something in themselves, right? To me, there's no higher purpose than if you can invest in the creativity of those around you. If you can do that, then you have fans. This is um, a game designer by the name of Will Wright. And he invented a, 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 an early video game called The Sims. Has anybody heard of The Sims, right? You build, uh, while he was building it, he put up an early, he, he, he was a, a traditional game builder. And most traditional games in those days were shoot 'em ups you know, you'd, you'd um, try and kill things, right? And um, in the process of building his new video game, he built this whole kind of town. Uh, he put it up online in a beta version, and the town wasn't finished yet. And he noticed something really kind of odd. People started building the town and doing things in the town. And he thought, oh, this is really cool. People are actually interacting more uh, because they have the opportunity. So that turned on a light bulb for him. And what he discovered is that it's far more interesting and effective thing to do to construct games around the person who's playing them. In other words, let them control the game, let them build things, let them do things that are important to them, give them a creative language so that they can interact and become creative themselves. That was the magic key. And with that, sold over 100 million versions of The Sims because you could be creative in it. We notice this more and more now that, that when you give people tools for creativity and you surprise them and delight them, they feel like they're getting better, like they're doing something. Um, and that is a, a very, very powerful thing. Especially as we start to change the ability, our ability to be able to experience the world. Um, I had a chance to try Google Glass for a while. And I'll tell you, it's a really um, kind of peculiar feeling because you're out in the world and you want to see something in front of you and it gives you information about your environment around you, makes you see the world in a very different way. So you can meet a friend and it will tell you he owes you $20, right? You might have forgotten that fact, huh? Um, you're walking down a street you've never been in before and it will give you the menu of this restaurant over here and whether somebody liked something over there. It's a different way of being able to experience it, right? In the old way, when we wanted to find out about who our audience is, we did demographic research, right? We want to figure out, you know, what your age is, um, what your salary is, where you live, what your ethnicity is. And from that, this was all science, right? From that, basically what demographic research is, it's one big fat flying guess, right? It's like, if you're of this sort of group, then we project that you'll probably behave in this kind of way. Well, we all know that that is, at best, um, a kind of iffy proposition. Psychographics is more about measuring behavior. It's about thinking about how people do what they do and projecting that behavior forward. In other words, if I know that you did X, Y, and Z in the past, you will probably do X, Y, and Z, some version of it going forward. Now, the problem with this has been, up until recently, that psychographics is sort of a touchy-feely kind of thing, because how do you measure behavior in a, in a really specific way? 
But the thing about the internet is that it actually makes beha measuring behavior um, easy on a vast, vast scale. It's not just a couple of hundred people or a couple of thousand people. You can measure the, the um, behavior of millions and hundreds of millions of people uh, in whatever they do. Why is this important? Because people lie, right? They don't lie because they just want to deceive you. We each have a version of ourselves that we want the world to see, right? Um, if I tell you that I only listen to classical music, but secretly on the side, I listen to country music, but I don't want you to know that because you might think something different about me, right? Then I'm not going to tell you that fact, right? Um, so a reassuring lie is always a more comforting thing. Now, how does this change things? So in the US, the way they used to measure ratings for radio, for television, for everything, was they would choose a subset of people, and you, they would send them what they called diaries. And you were supposed to, every day, write down what you listened to or watched. And then you would send it in, and that would be the way that, that they could tell how many viewers a, a show got, right? Um, and billions of dollars are decided on this. So in 2010, suddenly Nielsen, the largest measurement uh, company, decided that instead of the diary thing, that they would send people these little gizmos that would fit on their, um, on their belts, and it would listen to your environment all day. And it could tell when you listen to this radio station and for how long, and watch this television show and for how long. And suddenly there was no guesswork. You want to guess what happened to the ratings? It was really striking. It completely changed the, the order and the ranking of how stations were, what people were actually listening to. They weren't lying, but they weren't remembering outside of that version of themselves that they wanted to project to the world. So um, this was the thing that all, all but destroyed talk radio in the United States. AM talk radio is a shadow of its for, former self because it used to be the most powerful thing because it got lots of, of, of ratings. But they discovered that actually people weren't listening to it in ways that they want. So how does this apply to orchestras and to the arts? It means that the traditional ways in which we start measuring that third thing I talked about in technology, that way of measuring audience and setting expectations, is we're still stuck, for the most part, in the Stone Age. Um, and we have to have a better way of understanding our audience. And fortunately, there are models that we can look at. So one of the biggest, of course, is Google. Um, Google is constantly doing what they call A-B testing. A-B testing is throw up one version of something and a second version of something, or maybe even a third version of something, and all with subtle differences. It could be a different headline, it could be a different type font, it could be whatever. And then they measure over the course of however long they put it up, and a million people click this, and four million people click that, and you know, three million people click this over here. They take the one that, that did the most, and then they test it against something else. This goes on thousands of times a day where they're constantly testing this. Believe it or not, this one, you probably can't see what it is that they're trying to test there, partly because it's a bad slide, but more important, the, the, the thing they're testing is the amount of white space around the box. You'll see that they're very, very, very minor kind of way, the, the, the amount of white space between the Google search box and the bar below it is just slightly different. And it's to that degree of minutia that they can tell what is the optimal way of being able to design what they do, right? In order to do that, you have to be able to fail. You have to be able to fail over and over and over and over again. Now, I don't know what it's like here in Spain with orchestras, but in the US, uh, money is so tight and resources are so tight and it's so difficult that we have practically wrung out of the industry the ability to fail. 
And what initiatives we do tend to be big and expensive things to do. And so, um, first of all, we don't do very much of it because we don't have the resources. And second, if we fail, the consequences for failure could be catastrophic. We need to change the, the, the kind of paradigm of how we approach failure so that we celebrate failure, so that we do failure over and over and over again, not to fail, but to learn from failure. A smart failure is worth much more than a casual success because we actually learn something from what that failure is. Right? So part of it is that we have to build into the culture. Remember I talked about the culture of an organization? Part of the culture of an organization has to be not just a tolerance for failure, but the ability to celebrate fa failure because that's how we learn. Big data. Everybody's talking about big data right now. This is the, this is the, the topic du jour right now. Um, we are so awash in data. Now, I'm a journalist, and um, I naively thought that if we could measure all sorts of things, you know, that all it is a question of getting more and more and more and more information. And the journalist's job is to sort through that information and give some sort of sense of what it means, what's important to pay attention to. The problem is that big data produces such noise uh, that it's, it's very difficult unless you ask very smart questions uh, to figure out what it means. The other thing is, is that it can tell you anything you want it to tell you um, because there's so much of it. So big data is great, but big data comes with some very large caveats. How does big data get collected? So, this is a diagram of um, the trackers on a web page. Every time you go visit a website, if there's any kind of advertising or um, somebody on it who wants to figure out where you're going next or what you're doing on that page, there's a little cookie that gets deposited into your, um, into your browser cache. And the average browser has more than 200 of these trackers. So that's why when you go from site to site, you'll notice that some ads follow you around. If you do a search for a certain airfare to a certain city, all of a sudden you start seeing every ad that you see is for Barcelona, or you know, it's, it's, um, it's pretty astonishing. Uh, but what they can tell out of this is very precisely what our behavior is. It, it really kind of creeps you out when you think about it, but on the other hand, the ability to kind of understand how people are interacting with what you do is pretty amazing. Um, and they create maps out of these so that they can start to, to understand. Out of that has become a reevaluation of how we measure engagement. Right? Um, it's not just about, I got a million people to come to my website. Um, if a million people come to your website and none of them does anything as a consequence, none of them is changed, none of them is inspired to click on anything or share anything or, or whatever, then what difference does it mean having a million viewers? You, it it makes, no, makes no impact, right? So this has led to massive investment in figuring out how do we measure engagement? How do we measure how much you value what it is that you saw? What is it that you did as a result of that that hasn't had an impact on you and an impact beyond you? And so this is where all of the big money in tracking research is going right now, is figuring out algorithms for engagement, right? Because in typical fashion, and the arts does this, this is almost all we do, is we tend to measure outputs rather than impacts. So if we go and play for school kids and we reach 10,000 school kids with a concert, that's an output. 
And that's often where we stop in terms of analyzing uh, the impact of what we do. Instead, we need to figure it out a couple of rings out. How were people changed? What did they do after? How did they do it? Right? That's where the really interesting stuff starts to happen. And there are places where they're really doing some interesting research. USC, um, the Norman Lear Center for 12 years, has been developing data models so that they, can, they see how when you inject a message into a popular TV show, where does it show up? consequently in the next month after that. Does it change public policy on something if you do something about the environment? Does it change, what does it change and how? Um, this is really sort of exciting stuff, but the, the, um, the fact is, is that the arts uh, not only aren't using it, in many cases are actively hostile to it. Um, and I think for the reason that they you know, we have never had the mass audiences. And so we do what we do for the reasons we do it. And it would be very disappointing if we learned that those weren't the reasons that people were using what we do. I think ironically, and, and this is what the Norman Lear people say, is that if we actually tapped into the power of being able to understand this, we would find out that the arts have much more reach, uh, potency, and impact than we've ever imagined, right? That's why this kind of research in understanding your audience is so important. You can say, we have an audience of X, and that's great. What we know online now from billions of visits is something called the 99-1 rule, which means that for every 100 people who um, encounter you, uh, 90 of them will just look at something and they'll move on. There's no trace, no footprints of what they've done. Nine of them will be interested enough that they'll have some sort of interaction. And they might share it in a, in a way, they might leave a comment, they might, you know, they, they had some sort of interaction. But one person will become an evangelist for what you do will tell lots of people, will uh, make something around what you did. Um, they will become a fan, right? This rule actually cuts across practically everything. You can't change this rule. That's why when investors are making investments in technology, what they want to know, the first question they want to know is, does it scale? Does it scale means, I'm not interested in this if it only has 10,000 users, because that means only, you know, 100 people are actually going to, to participate. I want to know how many millions of people so that I create a lot of that 1% heavy contributor base, right? So you have to assume that for every thousand people you get who pay attention to something you do, that 900 and, you know, nine, um, uh, 990 of them uh, aren't going to do anything with it. So it's what those others do that's important. We also have to think about um, the way in which we deliver our product. Right? There's been a lot of resistance in thinking that um, that anything outside of the concert hall is an experience that is valuable, right? So, so the ultimate experience might be sitting inside that concert hall with a group of people. Um, and let's say that's the 100% experience, right? But if it's a recording that they're listening to, the radio broadcast, a stream, uh, something, how does that relate to the engagement, right? Now you could say that that being in the concert is the 100% experience, but it's possible, we all know, to go to a concert and to daydream and not really listen and you're not really paying attention, right? Meanwhile, you could be at home sitting with a score and in rapt attention and is that not a, a, a more valuable experience, 
right? Um, likewise, in terms of venues, right? We think that it has to be in a concert hall where the acoustics are special, where everything, but you know what? That's a, a very formal kind of way of doing concerts. And it's also a static way of doing concerts. And for, in, in some version of it, it's a very good way to listen to a concert. But doing it in a space, you know, like this, uh, where maybe the acoustics aren't quite so good, and maybe the chairs aren't quite so good, and et cetera, et cetera. It enhances the experience kind of thing. I'm not saying it's a better thing. I'm just saying that we have to expand the kinds of experiences and conditions in which we're willing to give concerts where the, the, the measure of perfection of what we do is that acoustically perfect thing in the concert hall. It's not dumbing it down, it's not making it a lesser experience, it's making different experiences. So what we do, um, I, I help produce a series at Carnegie Hall, and what we do with orchestras is, is um, we measure the kind of level of engagement that we have. So here's at this concert. So if we sell out, we do six nights in a row at Carnegie Hall, and if we sell out every ticket, we're going to reach 18,000 people. Okay, but you know, the cost for that is really quite high. Hard actually for me to justify the cost of bringing all these orchestras from all over the country, right? But if we do things online, we do streaming, there's a radio broadcast, and we do on the website, we, do a, we did a little um, um, course that people could take and interact with. There's 10 hours of, of learning about how, what makes good programming, and so, all sorts of ways to get involved with people. Now suddenly we're reaching 500,000 people. And I'm not going to be the person who says that, that the experience that they had in the hall is in 100% time, 100% of the cases, a better experience than what somebody else might have encountered in another, in another form. Right? So now instead of reaching 18,000 people, I'm reaching 500,000. And if I start to apply some sort of relative measurement of experience, if I had a way of being able to judge people's engagement, then I have a more accurate way of being able to tell how many people are interacting with me. There's the breakdown of, of, uh, of the uh, last year that we did. You can see. So for me, it's about changing arts organizations from being makers of content, about being producers, about selling a product, to becoming an infrastructure that enables a community to interact around something that we think is important. Right? This is art not as a product, but as a process as a process by which the community is a part of the experience both before the concert happens, during the concert, and afterwards. They have to be able to have some sort of way of interacting with it once it exists. So I want to give you a, an example here. This is a, a site in the, in the US called House. And, um, they started by, they were originally a traditional site that um, put up information about home remodeling. Now, you can get lots of advertising for this because there's a lot of money in home renovation, all right? Um, but the site did sort of moderately well. It didn't really take off until they turned it over to their audience, right? So it's divided up into three se sections here, and then the content, the content is, uh, is, some of it is created by professionals, but probably only 1%. The rest is people posting about great examples, they've seen cool things, they want to share it, it's all social media, um, there's guest people that, that they ask to do it connects you up with services so that the service people are talking to the community, discussions about what works and what doesn't work, and then finally to the products. And you can see that the numbers in this are just staggering. By the time you get to the convert, the commerce part, which is basically the ticket sale, right, if we want to translate it into our business, um, you have two and a half million people being driven to that because they have that relationship 
with you before they ever think about redoing their bathroom or buying you know, some faucet or whatever. They have that kind of relationship with you so that when it comes time to do something, they, you're, you're the person they're going to go to. Right? That's what I mean by, about having these pre-relationships. And that's possible on a scale now with technology that we were never able to do it before. So everybody talks about social media. Uh, and, and you have to be on social media. And so I thought I'd talk for a moment about that. Um, this is Cher Hollick um, from March. It goes back now a little bit. Um, you'll notice that Facebook is by far uh, the largest driver of, um, of referrals, right? In other words, people sharing things and then people uh, uh, clicking on them. Um, you'll see down at the bottom, though, those four lines down at the bottom. Um, that's LinkedIn, Google, YouTube, Reddit, StumbleUpon, and Twitter. Now, most arts organizations I know have Facebook and they have Twitter and they probably have a YouTube. But look at that red line in the middle. That happens to be Pinterest, which is the largest, um, fastest growing network currently. And all it really is is pictures. Just people sharing pictures with a little comment under it, sometimes, sometimes not. Um, it would not be surprising in five years to see uh, Pinterest and um, uh, become uh, one of the dominant networks here. And it already uh, far exceeds the aggregate total of all the other social networks. So, you can take away several lessons from this. One, one is, I think most important, is that it isn't about words, necessarily. A good image, a good way of, of being able to contextualize that isn't just about telling you information is important, right? In the orchestra business, in the arts generally, when we think about educating the audience or trying to reach more people, we think about explaining it. And then, you know, what? Every time you go to a concert, what do you get? Program notes, right? Lots of program notes, lots of text. Well, that's one way to enhance the experience. That's one way to, to explain what we do or set the context. But it's actually, when you start to look at the research, not necessarily the best way. So how could you contextualize what orchestras do in a way that isn't just by sharing more information? How do you get them to understand that the texture of this instrument is different from the texture of that? That percussion isn't just about hitting things, but it's about, um, it's about color and about depth. Right? There are all sorts of ways of being able to contextualize what we do, but we somehow seem stuck in this way that we used to share, which was effective, but maybe there are better ways now. Um, so this is, this is an example of, of you know, what the current share rate is, 27 or 21 for Facebook and 7 per, for Pinterest. But you'll also see that the social distribution of this kind of sharing happens almost immediately. If you put something up and nine hours later it hasn't done its thing, it's never going to. Right? That's, that's partly a function of um, the algorithms that the social networks use to determine what gets shared. Now Facebook has become really problematic lately. About uh, six months ago, probably nine months ago, they changed their algorithm. Right. Um, and they changed it in such a way that it, it has become more and more difficult to create a, a fan base on Facebook and have it mean anything, right? So they tried for a while to get you to buy ads on the side. The problem is nobody bought them because they weren't terribly effective. So Wall Street kind of hammered them for that because where's the revenue, where's the revenue? So they decided to figure out where the revenue is. So now you get in your, um, in your news feed, you get more and more posts like this, which are by sites called you know, Metro Mile or Lumo Body Tech. Who the hell has ever heard of these sites, right? 
what they are is businesses who have set up sites that look like journalism, look like whatever, but are actually companies trying to sell things. And they pay for the placement inside your news feed. We never followed Lumo Body Tech, but they're in our news stream somehow, right? And the algorithms say that you're a likely customer for it for some reason. Um, so that's a little insidious and a little annoying. Um, so then you think, okay, I will be one of, those, one of those organizations and I will pay for ads to be inserted into the Facebook stream. And so up pops this thing and it says, hey, I want to spend $3,000 and you'll be in there. Hey, great, you know what? You check your stats and you'll be pleased to see that it got X number of visitors. They're estimating you could get 1.3 million visitors or not visitors, people who will see this ad, this post. But it's deceptive um, because what they've done is they've changed the algorithm so that if you have 100,000 followers on your page, uh, doesn't mean 100,000 people are going to see everything that you post. And it used to be that you could get half of, the, half of your fans would see what you posted, but when they changed the algorithm, this is what happened. The, what they call organic reach, that is you just post something and then it goes out to your fans, went from 16% on average in just a month or so down to 6% and it's somewhere down um, to about 4 to 5% now. That means for every 100 posts you put up, only four of them are going to reach your entire audience. Right? So you could have a million followers on Facebook, but if they're not going to see what you're doing and they can't interact with it, what good is it? Right? All of this to encourage you to buy those sponsored posts that get into the news feed. It's a kind of insidious thing. The other pro problem with this is that the rules keep changing. And so any organization that invests in a platform that they don't own to the exclusion of everything else, you will be totally at their mercy. That's why it's important to spread around what you do over many kinds of platforms. Um, this, is a, this, is, this is an example of how quickly um, the, the, the ratio between page likes and the reach of that audience changed. You see it's pretty stunning. So for me this all gets back to how do you tell your story? How do you make the case of all that mil those millions of other things that you could be doing with your time? Why should you pay attention to what I do? And so I look at corporations that are selling their messages really effectively. And you can see a big change in the last five years. This happens to be Nike's mission, right? To bring, it's not to sell stuff, right? It's to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. The thing that has propelled Nike more than anything else in the last five years has been the ability of its customers to link up with one another and to measure themselves against other people. Nike Plus is the best thing that ever happened to Nike because now suddenly people can become part of a community and they say that their mission is not to create stuff, so you know the better stuff than the other guy, their mission is to make you better. Now think about how you try and sell your orchestra. Do you say, we're the best orchestra in Spain? We're the best orchestra in such and such? That's, that's a strategy that corporations aren't using anymore. It doesn't work, right? Instead, tell me what it is that you're going to do that's make, that makes me better or that I will come away with. Tell me how you're going to, if Nike can invest in your inspiration, why can't we invest in our audiences, our communities, creativity? Make somebody creative and they will be forever grateful. Part of the way you do that is to become more transparent. This is the Indianapolis Museum of Art and what they decided was that um, 
that they would uh, become completely transparent. And so they put up this dashboard, which you can visit online, and it records in real time, every day, how many people came to the museum, how many memberships were sold today, uh, even how, ma how many kilowatt hours of electricity they used, right? Now, they don't know how people will use this information. But what they noticed immediately was it changed their relationship with their audience. By being transparent, by being out in the community and saying, you can know anything about us, and oh, these are some interesting things about us, uh, it changed the kind of relationship that they had with people. It made them more interested in, in having a different kind of relationship. And I think that what, what the ultimate goal of an arts organization is, is if you come to any one performance, that's not who you are. That's, at a moment in time, that's something that you did that can represent you. Who you are is over a period of time and the kinds of things that you do and a little bit this here, a little bit over there and the, the aggregate of that, right? So we want to build an aesthetic and then we want to communicate that aesthetic to the community so that they internalize it and it becomes part of their aesthetic as well, right? And that's all about telling story, telling a good story about yourself, not just about yourself, but where you are in relationship to other things. So BMW doesn't say, hey, we've got the best engine parts and we put things together. They, spell, they, they sell the experience. What does it feel like to be in, right? Faster piece. You know exactly what that means, right? I want that. I want that. It's cool, right? Um, this. What does this say about music, right? It it's defaces the, what, the, what the iPods look like. But you know what? It gives you a sense of, of mu music sort of being used in a different way. I love this one. It's a, an ad for a, an iPad Air. Um, the tagline at the bottom is extra hardware required for some uses, <laughs> um, like mountain climbing on Everest. Right? Um, this is um, probably saw this Apple ad maybe um, uh, about Esapekka Salonen, and it just follows him around using an iPad. Um, and it's not an ad for Esapeka, it's an ad for iPads, but iPad, Apple, wants to associate itself with creativity, right? Apple doesn't sell you something to say, hey, we're better than the other guys. What they sell is how you will feel when you use it. And here is one of the most creative people in the world, and this is how they use it, right? Show us how it will make you creative. Why is that so hard for orchestras? Um, another thing that we can do in all of this is to reach to, to people, to give them experiences that they otherwise wouldn't have. And the, the cost for this has come down so incredibly. I know later the Medici people will be here to talk about Medici TV, which is a marvelous, marvelous thing. But um, just in the last year, we wanted to, I work with a, a small music festival in California, um, Ojai Music Festival. and um, we found, a, when you start to price out a five camera shoot of a concert, you discover that it's a really expensive thing to do. We found this guy in New York um, who has developed a, a system for five cameras, uh, but instead of $100,000 or you know, $10,000 a concert to do it, and we had you know, 26 concerts over a period of five, six days, um, that he could actually do it for less than 1000 um, and the quality of it blows you away. It's in full HD, full music, full whatever. Um, this is the cost of being able to do this. What we've found out when we measure the audience that comes in is that it's primarily people who've had a relationship with the festival over decades but haven't happened to be there and this is their opportunity to continue that kind of relationship. Right? You also want to uh, switch up the way people think about you. This is Miami City Ballet uh, came up with a whole sort of ad campaign with the Miami Heat basketball team. Um, they got so much attention for this just in thinking about dancers as athletes and the Heat got so much attention for it as the art of basketball, right? You look for partners who have interests that are aligned 
with yourself. Um, and it's a way, again, just as people, what they choose to, sh uh, to share defines them, who you decide to collaborate with also helps to, to, to define you. This is Curtis Institute uh, Music, um, and they decided to put up a, a MOOC, a massive online, a, a massive open online course. Um, and it was Jonathan Beast uh, exploring the Beethoven sonatas. Now, Curtis, for those of you who don't know, a really teeny tiny school, very elite school, uh, has an acceptance rate of about 1.75%. Um, it only has 176 students at any one time, right? So if you look back, they're almost 100 years old, and you look back over the years, and there are only about 30 students a year who graduate, right? So Curtis has a huge impact, uh, particularly in American orchestras. Every big orchestra has at least a couple of Curtis graduates, and there have been all sorts of, of, of you know, major instrumentalists um, who have come out of it, um, but not that many graduates. But they realized looking forward that they needed to increase the base of people who would support the school, uh, otherwise they were going to fail. So they did a massive open online course, and they were stunned when 7,500 students signed up to take this Beethoven course, which is more students for this one course than have graduated in the entire history of the school. Not only that, when they surveyed who was there, more than half of them had never heard of Curtis. And because they now had a contact with them, they've been able to develop relationships with these people. It transforms the place of the school in the larger world. Baltimore Symphony is doing something. This is a, this is a, a, a new thing right now that is getting lots of traction. There are at least a dozen examples in the US where uh, because the newspapers have essentially stopped covering culture, most of them outside of the New York Times, a couple of big, big papers, um, who can tell a story better than a, a journalist, somebody, you know, uh, somebody trained to tell stories? So a number of orchestras have started hiring journalists who are out of work, by the way, because, because um, uh, newspapers are, are, are giving up on it. Um, and hiring journalists in a good way, they write stories about it that aren't puff pieces about it. They find stories that are interesting. So I chose the Baltimore Symphony because I think they're doing the most interesting job of this. The very first thing that they put up was um, a big data project that looked at every program of every top orchestra in the United States for 2014-15 and did a statistical analysis to see what kind of uh, what kind of uh, music was being performed and where. So they got ethnicity, they got all sorts of data about it. Then they could start to make the case of, so this is how Baltimore Symphony fits in. This is how we see the world. If you're going to tell your story, you can't just do it in isolation. You've got to do it in the context of something else. And that means talking about the something else a lot and what you do, making the case compellingly for what you do in a smaller way. Right? So my informal rule for social media is if you've got a social media account that you're feeding regularly for every 20 tweets that you put out, only one should be about you. The other 19 should be about what, what's interesting in the world that affects what you do. You're setting the context. And like they say in politics, the person who gets to define the question is the person who wins the argument. Right? If I get to say what the question really is, then I can answer it in the way that I want. If you want to get the audience, you have to define what the larger thing is. Their second stuff was, so what's next for class? They're thinking in big terms and then relating. The other thing you've got to be able to do is write a great headline. Best headlines in the world right now in terms of attracting click-throughs is, is, is a site called BuzzFeed. 130 million unique viewers. Um, 
and they, 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 they do something called clickbait, which is, which is really annoying because you click through. You can't stop yourself from clicking on a headline because the, the headline is, is you want to find out what it is. And practically always when you click through, it doesn't deliver on the other side. But the fact is, is there, it, it tells you an awful lot about what gets people's interest. And they're constantly measuring what will get people to click through. How can we use this in the arts? If we look at how they package things in the most sort of clickbaity kind of way, that should give us a clue as to what it is that we have to, how it is that we need to present our stories. Because in order to get people to come into a place like this, you have to get them there first. And that means setting the context for how it is that they're, they're going to find their way into that place. Um, how do you do that? A number of places are now not only hiring journalists, but hiring data science, science people. People who are actually expert at being able to think about data in a way that just is way more sophisticated than I can understand, right? Um, and so you want to set up data models about how your audience works and their behavior so that you can learn from it and uh, attract them in the way they want to be attracted. So I leave you with this last thing, which is, is Albert Einstein, who said, creativity is contagious. Pass it on. If um, the arts are about the most creative thing possible, but sadly, I think we sometimes miss the creativity or the idea that we are in the creative business for the details of just trying to get it on the stage. Thank you very much.